Ryan Kennedy and Ivy McDermott watched an awe and faint arousal, respectfully, as Shrub Larder sat on a trio of high power, high status, and high ego nobles, and through the use of blunt language, legal babble, and threats of economic coercion, browbeat the nobles into submission. Without even needing to lean on the three terrifying commandos standing behind her, the senior investigator forced three nobles, whose previous relationship with the Imperium was holding a gun to the Senator Drill Instructor, to forcing an exercise through, confessing to crime after crime after crime. And the thing that really made the two pies respect the utterly terrifying tax lady in front of them, she also brought out evidence proving they weren't confessing to false things under duress, but were simply telling her what she already knew. It was almost anticlimactic as these nobles confessed to hunting the pair of pilots from their time at 773 to their enlistment in patrol, and all through the training, to following them and using their connections to try and pin them down, suggesting their progeny, their allies, and those they had blackmail on would constantly attack the pair in class and out of it, trying to make them slip up in a final way, or because they shot down a single gunship in a war. That single declaration to a room full of service women caused the two pies to stiffen. However, they relaxed upon seeing Selwyn's approving nod and hearing the senior agent's words. I feel I shouldn't need to remind you, but it speaks volumes about my faith in your cognitive ability that I must. That was war. That was conquest and a violent invasion of another planet. Dress it up as liberation or subsumption as much as you want. There were soldiers on both sides fighting and dying. I don't feel I need to inform you that blood status only counts for so much in the field of honour. She begins to pace back and forth in front of the collected nobles. Skill matters significantly more than blood, than heritage, than right. Skill and luck. And it seems these pilots have both. Which makes it all the more galling. Your mistress has decided to attempt to illegally remove them from the Imperium's pool of expertise. And without paying the requisite fees to acquire Imperial forces for your own personal use. Two strikes, dearies. The agent says with a smile. Now, I have taken the liberty of relieving you of your communication systems, and am in the process of sending a message to your mistress. You three, on the other hand, will be transferred to ITAT headquarters for processing. Senior Agent Troblada snapped her fingers, and the commando swiftly and efficiently untied and then handcuffed the three nobles. They were then frog-marched out to the command center, while the haughty idiots gaped open-mouthed at the sheer disrespect they were being shown. Well, now that's done, I think we can end this little fracas. You two pilots, I want a full debrief by tonight. Senior Drill made sure we can talk in your office. Let's make sure these charges stick. Semwin never wanted to smoke. She came into the service with excuses on her lips about bad lungs, wanted to keep off stamina and addictive personalities. She could clearly remember the first time she smoked. It was after a mission that went exceedingly well. No pilots lost and the wing barely even had to show their weapons to scare away the pirates, nosing up to her small convoy. She threw up in front of the spacer she was supposed to lead, and coughed up half a lung, causing them to laugh at her. The second time she smoked was when the wing came back in body bags, and the rest were left in the void between the stars after a mercenary group hired by a rival merchant family jumped them, mid-refueling. She couldn't stand to listen to the mother say prayers for the dead without doing something, so she left the room, lit up a cigarette, and cried. Senior drill matron Semwin didn't remember the third time she smoked. She stood outside the communications bunker and looked up at the stars. The sun had set hours ago, and even though she could still faintly hear angry words from the inside of the bunker, the work and interrogations were well over. She brought the herbal stick up to her lips and breathed in, the ember on the end flickering as the smoke flowed down into her lungs, the familiar bite of smoke barely even stirring her body anymore. She tapped the end against a tusk as she stared into the sky and began to name the constellations. Not that she knew them, it was an old game she and Talfin would play, naming the stars in the sky and making up stories for the imaginary lights between them, something to whisper to each other when they were along patrols in their interceptor, before promotions grounded them forever. It wouldn't be hard. A tap a few contacts, manufacture a scandal, get busted down a rank or two, and she could lead a wing again. Maybe she could bring her class, find a good ship with a good captain to get herself assigned to, keep the humans, keep the synth, keep the gear child. Reclaim her interceptor from storage and bring it out. Wear her scarf with pride once more, instead of as part of a uniform. She breathed out a cloud of green-tinged smoke into the humid air. Fuck, she muttered. The void was calling, 
and it was getting hard and harder to turn it down. How long had it been since she matched wits and skills against someone else? How long has it been since she's jeweled an equal? How long has it been since she's lost someone to combat? She breathed in the smoke again, the familiar drugs settling her nerves and calming the shakes in her hands. She stared out into those stars and yearned. Lady Shanxi Orlon, head of the Orlon dynasty, was not having a good day. Her messenger ship was late. She had left strict instructions that she was to be kept up to date on every little thing happening with her work in the patrol academy, and with so much on the line, a delay of hours could mean disaster. It was risky staying in one spot like this for too long, and invited attacks from her rivals through pirates. Already there was a wrecked hulk, resting in the void, all that remained of a debt collector, thinking the merchant vessel would be easy prey. As if, the head of House Ola muttered to herself, staring at a camera pointed towards the jump point. The messenger ship was late. Finally, the sensors picked up the familiar spike in Gravitron activity, indicating a jump was inbound, and as the tiny ship appeared in a warp of space-time, Shanxi Orlon hammered the button to open video communication. Well, she demanded, you're late. What do you have to say for yourself? It was only after those words left her lips that the Shulvanti noble realised the person standing across from her wasn't the captain of the messenger ship, but a fierce woman wearing the combat armour of Itad. She was smiling. This message is a courtesy. Due to your position as the head of an imperial noble family, you are being investigated for treason, attempted assassination, attempted assassination of an active duty member of the Shulvanti military, subversion of active duty service members of the Shulvanti military, oh, and tax evasion. She spoke with an odd cadence, trying to both rush and not rush herself. Her eyes kept flickering off screen. Did this amateur not have her intimidating speech memorised? Now hear me, Shanxi began, before getting cut off by the ITAD lady. No, hear me. You're advised to stand down, blow all consumer panels, vent all hydrogen fuel and turn off your engines. She replied with cruel enjoyment. Oh, what? You're just a messenger ship! Shanxi Orlon shouted back hand already moving to signal general quarters. The ITAD agent held up four fingers. Three fingers. Two fingers. One finger. No thing. The jump alarm screamed, as time and space rippled and discharged six navy frigates, flashing ITAD IFFs. The tax lady smiled. That. It wasn't a nice smile. So, then you got saved by commandos. Slivers asked from next to Cookie. She was wrapped around a small thermal pylon she bought with her money a few months ago, about the same time Cookie got his weighted blanket shipped in, actually. Yeah, Ryan Kennedy said, leaning up against the synth and sipping a mug of a strange shul drink. It was like hot chocolate, but using the bitterest, darkest chocolate you could find, mixed with a sharp spice and drowned in tea. All the spice would probably have had him coughing up a lung if the bitterness didn't make it feel like his throat was closing up. It wasn't... The worst thing Cookie had ever drank, but it's been 15 minutes since he grabbed it from the commissary shelves, and he wasn't even a quarter of the way through it. She appeared out of nowhere with her whole silent badass thing, scared the daylights out of the interior cadet. The cadet ran. I pulled a knife for the cadet's leg, and then things went fuzzy since the adrenaline started wearing off. Except that wasn't the truth. He could remember everything that happened that night with perfect clarity, but some of the things that were shouted by the nobles, said to get the ITAD to look the other way, were slightly inconvenient for all parties involved to know, so Milk and Cookie were encouraged to have fuzzy memories. He remembered everything. He remembered how the knife sunk in deep to the woman. No, the girl's leg. She could have been older than 19 in shell age. Nothing but a teenager playing soldier and doing the dirty deeds of someone else. He remembered her scream as her leg touched down, and the blade tore what it did not cut and the leg just collapsed sideways with a squish. He remembered her screaming as she dropped her rifle to the side and cried, pawing at her leg until she was silenced by a single shot from the commando. He remembered seeing her later missing that same leg. Quick setting infection, he was told. They had to amputate and she'll need a new leg. Not a problem, they said. It happens sometimes. But he still remembered the girl, sitting on her bed, crying into the shoulder of her comrade. A soldier stood guard around her, and as her leg was thrown into an incinerator... Maybe it was because he was older. He was 29 when the war ended, and in his late 30s when he put a knife through a kid's leg. Maybe it was because he had seen these injuries cripple his friends and comrades. Maybe it was because he was the shoulder being cried on. Maybe it's because he still feels the twinge in his leg, 
from a Bosch parachute landing. Maybe it's because he's not used to hearing them screaming. But this... Ryan Kennedy didn't think this night would be leaving him many time soon. Sliver seemed to realise what was going on in his head, as she uncoiled from the thermal pilot and wrapped around Cookie, resting her head on his shoulder. He leaned against her and they sat there silently, sipping at beverages neither wanted to drink, and watching the stars travel overhead. And that was where they were found in the morning, when the time came to return to cadet life. She should be shot! Victory comes with some leniency. Victory! Is that what you call it? She threw her fleet at the enemy without care for their lives. And she was able to rally them into that same suicidal charge. She's a leader and valuable. I don't think I need to remind you about what is happening in the periphery. If we get rid of her... Hang your future predictions and hang her! No, we will not. You... Me. The decision is no longer in your hands. Captain Rochelle is being transferred to patrol and given command of a patrol carrier, where she will remain until we have a need of her skills. Is that understood? Yes, champion. Yes, champion. I knew you were reasonable women. The Empress will be pleased that her glaives are still obeyed.